Um, we're delighted to have so many of you here tonight for our very first Copenhagen Startup Prime. Um, it's pretty amazing that so many of you came even though you don't know the concept, um, but we'll <laughs> tell you a little more about it later. Um, let me give you a little brief hands up on, uh, heads up on what's going to happen next. Um, in a couple of minutes, um, we'll start with the fireside chat interview that uh, Mike is going to um, have with uh, Thomas. Uh, before that, we have a short introduction by our uh, host tonight, uh, Rasmus from NorthCap. I'll give you a short, brief introduction on what Startup Brand actually is, what is the concept, why did it bring this uh, from the United States here over. Um, and now I would like you to welcome our host. Thank you very much to Rasmus. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks for coming, everybody. It's great to see so many people here. Normally, we are not so many. <laughs> Normally, we are like three people in here. So, so uh, <laughs> yeah, no, we are we're more. So actually, we are two companies sharing these offices. And uh, well, in Northcap, we are we are five people. Um, Thomas, one of them over here, a co-partner. Everyone. Myself, I'm called Rasmus. Then we are three others. Um, we are five partners running the the company. I threw my card on the different ones. I know the title is wrong, but don't doesn't matter. Um, what we do is invest in, in uh, IT startups here in Denmark and elsewhere in Europe. So we, in Denmark, we invest from seed stage and onwards. Um, outside Denmark, we invest a little bit later, more uh, mature companies. Uh, we very much like to invest in uh, B2B companies, B2B2C. And uh, we've been doing that since, uh, since 1999. It's our third fund now, we raised last year. And that means uh, for, for the startups that we work with that, well, it's a 525 million fund. It means that we are, we're quite active looking for, for, for investments. We did uh, six investments over the summer here. And uh, we, we're really busy, <laughs> but in a very good way. Um, and it's great to see that there's, there's a lot of good things to, start, to invest in. Uh, what else to say? Other than uh, I hope you enjoy the evening and you are more than welcome to grab hold of Thomas or I if, if you have some questions. Thanks for coming. So, Startup Brian, I just saw somebody tweeted, um, uh, retweeted uh, that you're coming without knowing the concept. Um, it's not too dangerous. I mean, Startup Brand is something that comes from Palo Alto originally. Um, has anybody of you uh, seen some of the videos? Uh, raise your hands if you have, maybe. Some of you know the concept. So, the idea is pretty much you invite over um, founders that share their stories on how they build their companies. And not so much only the success side, but also kind of how did they get there? How many times did they fail? How many times did they invent themselves, et cetera, et cetera? And kind of really build a crowd around that um, that inspires each other and kind of helps each other on, on the way. So I hope you, um, you enjoy not only listening to Thomas in a second, but also speaking to each other afterwards. There will be time for, for drinks and networking after, after the uh, interview, which is going to last approximately like 40, 45 minutes followed by a short uh, Q&A. So um, if you have any good questions, uh, spare them for, for afterwards. Um, one last thing that would be great. Um, use the, if you're on Twitter, use the, ha use the hashtag Startup Grind. We have some of the papers up here. Um, Thomas' uh, Twitter handle is at Mugdale. Um, our Twitter handle is at Startup Grind Copenhagen. So use that. Uh, feel free to engage online uh, during this. Now I would like, like oh, you to... I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, uh, there's, there's Wi Fi at uh, home. Uh, it's called just NC. You should be able to pop out. Great. And now I would like you to welcome uh, Thomas with a very warm applause. Um, get out of here. And, uh, Thank you. Nice to have you here. Um, we have been doing uh, quite a bit of research on you to, to prepare, for this, <laughs> prepare for this interview. Uh, and one of the one of the first things that struck me was your description on your blog. It, it says something along the lines of appropriately leverage existing diverse manufactured products via cutting edge sources. You don't recognize this? No. It's spam. It's, it's down by no. It's down by, or, no, no. <laughs> okay. Well, well. The bottom line is just that it's. It's a uh, it's kind of interesting formulation I think because actually uh, I think uh, some of the some of the lines actually kind of matches I think quite good what you are but anyway we can take this later I've on. never heard that so okay I'll have to show you <laughs> <afterwards>. <laughs> but seriously Thomas uh, 
You started uh, the first internet company, Wondo, at age of 17. That's about 18 years ago by now. Yeah. Smart Angularly Calculate. You launched the first uh, Mac and PC, uh, online magazines, Mac, WinPlanet. Oh, totally forgot that one. Followed red by Radiator, Buying Experience, Organic Network, 23, Social Square, Podio, Kinetic, SC, Upbeat, Holvi, and somewhere, finally. You've been either somehow founded them or on, who invested in, in some of these companies. Um, but uh, uh, you're also an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, parallel entrepreneur, angel investor, chair, chairman, board member, mentor, author, and organizer of Reboot. Man of many titles. <laughs> so, seriously, Thomas, <laughs> how much of this is luck? <laughs> <laughs> how much is luck? Uh, I guess everything is luck or it's passion, right? It's, um, <laughs> I don't think I see this. I mean, everything in life is luck, but I think it's a lot of passion. All right, cool. Front post. Okay, so so you're saying that luck has nothing to do with entrepreneurship at all? <laughs> if I think if you're really passionate about something, you're gonna be in interesting places in interesting times. And I've been in, I've happened to be in very interesting places in really interesting times. Um, to some, if you know, everything in life is random, but also because I was really passionate about it at times where no one were. Um, so you can look at it, everything I've done, and I think, I mean, I think I've been in a lot of interesting places, right? I mean, uh, I think you know, coming back to when we started Mondo, I was 17 years old. I was in in, sec in second year of high school, and. Um, to begin with, wh how my co-founders realized that I was only 17 years old when we signed it, signed the incorporation papers, uh, they were like kind of university dropouts that oh, they've been studying for many years. Uh, but being at that kind of summer where I needed to, to convince my mom and dad that I was going to leave high school, at least take a, an absence. Uh, the absence has been kind of going on for 19 years now. Um, <laughs> And, and just really realizing that, I mean, this is a point in time that's never going to come back. You're, you know, you're in 95, there's, you know, when we started Bundu, there was like eight or nine websites in Denmark or something. Um, very quickly, a lot of stuff started happening. Some of the people in the room here, uh, we started playing around a lot of stuff. And you just realized, I mean, this is never going to go back. You could always do the third year of high school. But that very special moment in time where where you could just see how much was going to happen, you could see the potential, yet everyone were laughing it, it off and just, you know, ah, CD-ROMs are more nice, you can have more graphics and video and stuff like that, you know, remember the, the Web in 95 was very grey and very <laughs> textual. Um, and I mean, you know, is that sheer luck? Who knows? Yeah, might be, but it's also just being really passionate about a lot of things that ultimately turned out to be pretty substantial in the end. Yeah, because I'm thinking that, that since you have been able to, to spot many of these trends before quite a lot of people, I mean, there must be something in, in the way you have grown up that has sort of molded you into a guy that, that, that sort of was able to spot these things. So, so what was life, life like, I mean, in your family in the old days when you grew up? I mean, where did you grow up, by the way? Um, I, I grew up uh, kind of suburbia, <coughs> just outside of Copenhagen, pretty normal uh, kind of life. Uh, it was though a little peculiar, so I mean, I think I very early on saw that there were a lot of things, life could be a lot of different things. Uh, I grew up, grew up in a street that back then, this is 25, 30 years ago, was like publishers, uh, a crazy uh, Danish magnet called Simon Speaks. Uh, you know, uh, as I remember when he died, we were standing in front of his gates, in front of his palace, it was like our Diana moment. <laughs> um, the, the guy had his own bus, uh, all, you know, uh, he owned seven houses on the street, or ten or whatever it was, something really crazy. So, I mean, you know, I was kind of in an environment where you saw that life could be a lot of things. So, I, I, mean, I mean, I was probably spoiled by that, definitely, um, in terms of seeing, walking as a little kid back and forth with kind of a guy that, that kind of was a pioneer in kind of uh, urban planning, <laughs> where he was like, 85, 90 years old, we were walking with him, all the small kids, <laughs> back and forth. Uh, and, you know, just like, okay, this guy, he was like, he was fucking real, he'd done something so substantial in life. Um, so I think, I think that really uh, impacted me uh, early on in terms of seeing that, you know, you're, what is normal? 
you know, at least back then, that, that, that was kind of very, very special. And then I think, I don't know, computers were probably just geeky as every kids are. My brother and I went with newspapers for two years to buy a, a Commodore 64 in, I can't even remember, back when, 80 something. Um, and we started playing around with it and, you know, whatever, just playing with it. Um, and out of sheer coincidence, um, uh, I was playing a lot of ice hockey back then, uh, my whole family was actually. Um, and and uh, they needed kind of a, somebody to be the DJ uh, for these kind of big hockey games. And obviously that should be like a 12, 13 year old guy uh, doing that. And for f random purposes, the, the Mac was really perfect. So, um, um, so my dad bought a Mac in 92 or something uh, because it had the ability to be able to play music very fast. I still think it probably even is the only, Windows probably can't even do this still, where you in, in the Finder can sit with kind of 80 songs and then you can react to what's happening in the game and you can play the next song like instantly. Uh, later on I actually realized that that kind of, like, kind of crazy hockey DJing which is, is kind of very absurd but I mean you're sitting as 12, 14 year old, 3,000 people in a kind of very compact environment. It's, you know, it's play out, it's game time, it's all, the whole season is gonna come back to, uh, come down to something. And you're sitting there and you're not, and I don't know how we realized that my brother and I guess was also playing, I think we were playing together or we split the game or something. But I think, I don't know how we realized it, but we very early on realized that it wasn't just about playing some crappy music and being, you know, oh, let, let me show you what, hip new music I can play that I took from some crappy play from some, some, you know, some top list or whatever, but we very early on, and I don't really know why, realized it was, it was more like being in contact, kind of augmenting, uh, kind of inspiring the audience to go crazy and, f and very much kind of in touch with people, right? I, I, some years ago, <laughs> we had a kind of a retreat in, in one of my companies, and late at night, 2 a.m., we, we were all going to do like a very six minute talk, each one of us really drunk. Uh, and I did it on, on, on the, <laughs> the, the skills of hockey DJing. Um, but, but jokes aside, I, I think you know, things like this can be underestimated in terms of uh, understanding you know, a lot of this kind of whole social, how do you uh, facilitate something, how do you augment something, how do you build tools for other people where the tool in itself is not really something people should pay much notice to, it's just there. Uh, obviously, you then realize as the one making the tools or creating the event that <laughs> you can you have tremendous impact and and there's tremendous uh, difference in all the small details and the value you should put into it, your perspective. Uh, but it sh shouldn't really just be there to shine, right? You're just there, very humble, to provide something, uh, and then something magically can 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 happen, right? You know, the epic hockey game that is coming down, and you're totally in sync with the audience, and you press played twice and then people start going crazy and then you very quickly stop the music again because I mean that was what you wanted to start happening right the whole crowd three thousand people going crazy so so I, I don't know a lot of crazy stuff like that yeah. and you know I mean I, I didn't really spend much time in I mean I spent time in school but I very quickly gave up on it and we're mostly doing kind of student newspapers we did a pirate radio station uh, a friend of mine realized that a very one very special cassette deck player you could jack that into the sound to the kind of uh, PA system of the school, and then instead of just receiving the broadcast, we could broadcast. <laughs> uh, so we started broadcasting to the whole school in all the breaks, and then I don't know. At some point, we probably said something wrong. Somebody figured out what was going on. <laughs> I got pulled up to the to the vice uh, chair of the school, who also happened to be my hockey coach, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he, he very delicately said like. It's probably, obviously, Thomas, you don't know anything about this. I said, no, no, obviously, I don't know anything about this. But if you do know, and all have heard about the people, like, obviously, I'm, I, I don't, I know nothing about it. Yeah, yeah he, <laughs> he very kind of intelligently made it, I was realized there was probably a good time to end, uh, without anyone saving face or anything, uh, or losing face. So, I mean, there was a lot of stuff happening like that. We did a lot of crazy stuff. And, selling sandwiches to the kids because we were tired of sitting on the school board meetings and they all always said, we like all your suggestions, but we're really sorry, we don't have any money. So we just thought, what the fuck do we do? We make some money. 
And you know, very epic when the day came when we could sit and they all said, oh, it's a nice idea, small 14-year-old kids, but we don't have any money. We said, like, no, that's no problem. If you like the idea, we're just going to do it. We have money. <laughs> uh, that was pretty good. So I mean, a lot of stuff was like that happening. I really didn't, I mean, I wasn't really into the grades or anything. It was more all the stuff the school as a platform provided, or not that it really provided. I think we're just hacking with it or bored, so we started doing stuff instead of okay. listening to the teachers. Okay. So it seems like that you already, f from a quite young age, mm -hmm. you saw Simon Spies yeah. and his effect on people and, <laughs> and, and sort of the places around him. You uh, other things than him also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, but also, I mean, uh, so, so the hockey DJ, you, you saw that you could affect 3,000 people by the push of a button, and the same thing with the sandwiches, you could probably make a lot of people happy for having a bit of sandwiches. So it seems like you, from a, from a pretty early age, got on to starting stuff and just doing stuff. Yeah. That That's wasn't, right. that wasn't right. really planned. <laughs> that no, okay. was how it turned out. Okay. 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 Just out of curiosity, how long time did you have this pirate radio station? I can't recall. <laughs> okay. Six months, three months, whatever. Okay, okay. okay. We, we then realized, which probably is also a good lesson in life, that the, they then, the school board, the school then said, like, ah, but you can do it. Then you, then you just come up to the headmaster's office and put in a tape for the lunch break. And then we did that for six months and realized. <laughs> that was like being part of the establishment. That was fun. That wasn't funny. <laughs> we stopped doing right, that okay. very quickly again. That was so institutional. That was boring. Okay. <laughs> All right, okay. Very nice. Very nice. Okay. So, so when did you say you sort of you can you pinpoint sort of a moment where you say okay now I know startups and entrepreneurship is one of the spend the rest of my life. I'm, I'm not interested in startups and entrepreneurship. I'm I'm interested in doing things and changing right. things. Uh, so I mean I. I think we're so conscious about all this startup these days that, it, and we talk a lot about it. Fifteen years ago, you didn't talk about it. You just, you just did it uh, because you were passionate about things. So I mean, everything is random, right? I mean, it, it comes down to like sitting, like in '95. I was, I mean, it's crazy times. I remember we started Mondo. I, the day before, I'd been sitting with, with some other guys talking about starting an ISP, Internet Service Provider. Uh, which there were very few of and very kind of either geeky or very um, very um, uh, kind of institutional. So I mean it was, it was like this bottling crazy time and we've met through weird connections because I've been on this kind of bulletin board system like dial up where you dial up with a modem wasn't connected to the net to begin with and I, I met some guys that were doing a kind of wired magazine and, and then what it was called I can't even recall what it was called uh, it'll come um, wrote some awful, awful articles. Oh, yeah. uh, I think if, if uh, you, met, you were going to dig up dirt, if you digged up the one where I wrote about with the metaphor of the information superhighway, explained with the metaphor of a car and a highway, how the browser was the steering wheel, <laughs> the car was the computer, and yeah. Okay. Uh, if you dig that one up, then you, then you would have found some good dirt. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, we should have looked deeper, I guess. <laughs> Not too bad, okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay. So it seems like uh, like you ought to be the kind of guy that want to stir up trouble, want to just uh, uh, yeah do crazy stuff just just to do it and change things, right? Is, is that is that a <laughs> what? <laughs> I've, I've, yeah. Perhaps. Perhaps. Tr right, troublemaker okay, is probably troublemaker. a pretty right. good term. Oh yeah. yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> cool. Okay. So let's move a little bit. Um, uh, the, a different topic. Um, we we hear a lot about uh, Silicon Valley and all these other uh, nice ecosystems. I mean, why are you still a part of startups in Copenhagen? Why aren't you in Silicon Valley or Berlin or probably you are some of these places on the times, I guess? But why stick to Copenhagen? Oh, why in Copenhagen? Um, I don't know. I, I'm I'm old enough to come from an age where it wasn't really. Like 95 to a year, kind of 2000, 2002, it wasn't really a perspective. We were very provincial back then. I mean, we all started web agencies to begin with. That was how we all started. I mean, there's still kind of a, everyone that was a bit older or even younger now, there's a lot of people. When you ask people who have some kind of product or, a, you know, they've always been doing kind of some crappy web uh, consulting, web uh, agency thing at some point. That was the perspective. Then we started doing product companies. Um, some were doing them full time earlier than others. Uh, I should probably have done it earlier. Uh, but I mean, our whole perspective was copying concepts from the US. I mean, we did the first portal in Denmark. Like, uh, that's basically you know copying Yahoo, uh, night, summer '95. 
a couple of months before UB, uh, which some of you might know. Uh, Torba put in the pawn licks. We didn't because I was 17 years old. I needed to face my mom. <laughs> he won probably also for other reasons, but um, <laughs> right, okay. a substantial one. But I mean, it, the whole perspective <laughs> back then was really not, there was nothing that gave us the idea that we, or the confidence and the perspective that we could build global companies and we could do global things. Um, so I mean, I come out of, I come out kind of, of that tradition. It, it then obviously very changed very differently uh, kind of later on uh, when we get, got the confidence, got the perspective uh, uh, that we could do something. Uh, but I mean, at that point, uh, we're kind of stuck in Copenhagen with kids and Copenhagen is an amazing city to, to live in. So I mean, I'm, I'm very happy about being, uh, you know, people I will ask all the time, but I'm not, I mean, I can't imagine, also the pace of it and whatever. I love Copenhagen. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. I couldn't agree more. But I mean, there's a lot of you know, uh, there's a lot of you look at, for instance, why they just published an, uh, an article about the top ten best startup cities in Europe, and we have Stockholm, we have Berlin, we have uh, Helsinki, <coughs> we have Amsterdam, yeah, but Copenhagen is missing. Why do you think that is? Yeah, you'll have, you'll have to talk a while about <laughs> that. I think. I mean, mm -hmm. I think we all realize on a on a great scale. I mean, the Nordics are killing it. I mean, we're we're it in Europe. Um, We've contributed more to the internet stack than anyone else. Um, when you hit Facebook.com, you hit Linux, you hit MySQL, you hit PHP, um, you hit even some of the design patterns from 37 Signals have Danish. Uh, I mean, Varnish. It, what? Varnish. Varnish, probably all. The, I don't know whether Facebook. Okay, they also use Varnish. You also hit Varnish. So yeah, you, you hit a lot of stuff, um, and I mean, I think we can be extremely proud and, and confident these days about what it is we're doing, and I think that it's more of a story about you can't put three Nordic cities in there, they should just put in the Nordics as a category, we're only 25 million people. <laughs> uh, I mean, we're a third of Germany, but we produce more game-changing stuff than, than Germany and the UK. Um, so I mean, I've, you know, I. We, we, we just need to come together as a country uh, or as a, as a region and, and make it a, a bigger story because it's an amazing story. And, and I mean, that's also what's changed, right? I mean, uh, so coming back to the kind of provincial thing, and this is actually where, once again, the small things, I mean, we started Reboot in 98 uh, because once again, kind of, uh, you know, troublemakers, uh, we had this kind of uh, hippie, kind of hippie, whatever, edgy web, this web agency called Radiator. Uh, we just threw out our investors and we were just like, okay, now we're going to go punk. Um, and so we were so f tired of the internet becoming this corporate thing where kind of heads of marketing a compact computer were deciding on what was happening and whatever. It was very weird. So we were like, hey, we just wanted to bring all in all our, all our American heroes uh, and got all of them on board, right? Just for many of them, the first time ever they, they spoke at an event, uh, even spoke in Europe uh, at the least. And I mean, I think, you know, I think, and that really started changing a lot of things in terms of what the perspective was, also because the times were changing. But I mean, we suddenly realized that you were hanging out with these guys who <coughs> later on, or even at that point, were doing globally radical stuff. Um, but they were also just Nebraska farm boys in SF or crazy New York guys in the Valley and whatever, and we were hanging out with them in Copenhagen, drinking beer and partying for a week. <laughs> and they were just as stupid and hopeless as we were. So, I mean, suddenly the, the kind of perspective, also a new generation started coming. And I mean, suddenly there were a lot of Danish guys. Back then you needed to move to the Valley or to the US uh, to do some of the stuff. You don't need to do that any longer. But I mean, there's suddenly a whole generation of building global things, right? I mean, David Heinemeyer did Rails, uh, which I mean, you know, we were just messing around and doing some, cons you know, he was playing around with it. Uh, he was building a game, he was doing a games portal with, uh, with, a, with an old Danish entrepreneur also. And I mean, suddenly this guy, that was, you know, he suddenly ships this amazing thing and, and starts inspiring the perspective of what is possible. Um, Sendesk, Unity, I mean, a lot of other stuff started happening, but suddenly the we got the confidence somehow, and, the, and also the time started changing. Uh, <coughs> and it also it was a period of time where the internet wasn't hip, right? I mean, we were all totally burned out by, by the whole dot-com thing. And suddenly, I mean, all the sort of social technologies, everything you see on Facebook today was done 
in the years between 2000, 2004, 5, back at a time when nobody were interested in it again. Everyone were like, ah, the internet is dead. Uh, this whole dot com thing, you know, the internet doesn't change anything. It's just an efficient distribution vehicle or transaction e commerce platform or whatever. It doesn't really. And then the kind of whole the social age of the net um, came back again because that was also there in 94, 95. Uh, and then it all started to blossom again. Uh, it was a very crazy time. I mean, uh, I did reboot in 2004, 5, something like that, uh, with 180 people. Tim O'Reilly, uh, I don't know, Scott Heifman, Don Meetup. Um, I can't even recall all the people, a crazy lineup of people. And I mean, that was back when, when the internet again was down to like, by Nordic standards, down to 200 people that <laughs> were interested in it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then later on it became uh, big again. But I mean, it was, it, was a, it was a very special time that, that really inspired the kind of also this kind of the people of the internet, right? Which I think is, I mean, it, it comes in waves, then it goes very mainstream, and then it's like, then all the, the people of the internet come, come together at some point again when it's not hit. Yeah. And then they start doing interesting stuff that isn't really about doing a VC funded startup, but is about exploring things or playing around with things, right? And then eventually, 10 years later on, it looks like, you know, I mean, we're, we're just fooling around. I mean, David Heinemann was building a prototype of kind of something like Podio in Rails uh, with me, like for, for me, whatever, 2002, three ish. Uh, we started playing around with photo sharing when the first camera phones came out, and we hacked the software so you could send in an, a photo to an email address that would be posted to a blog, very simple hack. Uh, but later on, like, wow, what is this gonna mean for the world that you can capture something, press a button, and it's instantly shared with the world? I mean, this is 40% of the activity on Facebook, 35% of the activity on Twitter today. Um, and it wasn't because we we're, you know, we we're just playing around. And that's what happens when, when you're curious about things. And when you're passionate, when you're dedicated to believing that there is something in this and it's going to come at some point. And I mean, personally for me, I think what's been mostly frustrating so far in my life has been timing. Uh, that I've been doing the wrong things at the wrong times, right? I mean, there are, there are times when you should be playing and there are times when you need to be really in the, in the box and executing and, and building a company and making it happen when you're not playing. Uh, when you're playing, it's, it's okay not to have a million users or whatever because you're just playing. But when you're in the game, then you're, then you're in the game. And I think that's, I mean, then eventually a lot of this stuff suddenly starts looking like very bright, uh, Podio 23, et cetera. But I mean, that's stuff that we worked on 10 years earlier. I mean, it's, it's not something that came overnight because we were doing lean startup to get customer fit and whatever. It was because we've been playing around with it for 10 years. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so do we have like, like a story that goes with the um, uh, 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 with the whole uh, the timing issue. I mean, being being at the wrong time at the wrong place, or what was it just before what timing? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it probably as yeah. you say, it starts with yeah. being kind of very aware of where you are and what's happening at the moment. Um, but I think it's all it also deals with really the timing of what the world is ready for, right? <coughs> uh, and and when the time is right, when the technology is in place, when, uh, I mean, it's pretty apparent why photo sharing is big today with <laughs> camera phones and, and 3G and whatever, that, that it was a bit more rudimentary back in 2001 and two. Um, I mean, timing timing's a weird thing, right? I mean, uh, and, and another old friend, Nils Hartby, who was later made one of the largest uh, open source CMS projects in the world, uh, amazing feat he's done. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing his t-shirt today. Uh, I mean, we were playing around with this kind of mobile, and uh, I mean, we were, uh, so we were doing the photo thing, we were like, wow, there's also something about this SMS text thing. Imagine you could uh, write in, in around 140, 160 characters, a very short text from anywhere in the world, and you could publish it on the web. Um, so we built that, 2001. <laughs> I think it's called Twitter. Um, <laughs> Uh, and back then, I mean, you know, time, we were just playing around and then we were like, nah, that won't work. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, we were like, we built a prototype and I mean, Nils had like a physical box that was like an SMS modem gateway that <laughs> took the, whatever. <laughs> um, so I mean, 
you never know, right? I mean, Twitter is just blocking, and this was just blocking. All these ideas are not really, really unique per se, right? There were a lot of people playing around with SMS blocking back then, and photo, <coughs> and photo blocking, right? I mean, people call it Instagram today, but I mean, <laughs> there's been like a gazillion service before. Um, and I mean, you know, so what is timing? Obviously, I mean, you can pat yourself on the back and then you can, you can link back to some, I actually have a blog post from 2001 where I say, we played around with it, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can find it on the web somewhere. Um, um, yeah, um, but I mean, it, a lot of these things are, kind of, it's what the net is about, right? It's about organizing, it's about sharing, <coughs> and it's just the latest version of it being implemented. So I mean, um, so I mean, you can just, so, I mean, on timing, I think you can just become really frustrated if you're playing the wrong game at the wrong time. Then you become like a crazy visionary that starts talking that is only about the ideas or, uh, yeah, you know, or somebody, whatever, and, and you can become really frustrated and really, um, really get into a wrong place. Um, but at the same time, I, I mean, what the dot com kind of burn up created was like a very sacred place for three, four, five years where a lot of people. A lot of people had lost so much confidence in capitalism, building companies, a lot of stuff. Also, don't start, you know, VZ money was not a concept that existed back then. Um, and that created kind of a really safe playground, right? So, I mean, that, that's beautiful. But, I mean, then on timing, I mean, we, we realized probably with Podio is we were all kind of, we were all, at a, everyone on the team, like, needed to do something. I think we all felt like we had something to prove. Yeah, right. I also had something to prove, right? I, I, you know, I didn't really, I hadn't really been part of doing that kind of hit. And that goes for everyone on the team. We were like, we knew what we were doing. We'd been doing it a very long time. And it was like, okay, now let's do it, right? And, and I mean, with all the, and, uh, and uh, it just becomes, for me, like very more kind of legendary and epic for every day that goes <coughs> by because all the other things I'm involved in today were, there's a lot of things that are really tough, and I mean, with Podio, it's just like, it was a crazy process, it was super tough, and we were fighting it out, and whatever, and, but I mean, we were shipping and executing, like, I mean, at this, every time I'm just like, ah, can't we just be on that kind of <laughs> journey, rocket ride, instead of all this frustration, struggles, and all that stuff, can't we just, like, do the right thing all the times, and, and then, then, I mean, then you can call it luck or whatever you can call it, or whatever. But you, you just feel re you you just really appreciate that that there is something special going on there. That you, I mean, you can make it happen. You can, but at some some point it kind of also starts taking the idea starts. I mean, taking over and and it's much. It wants to do something. It, it's bigger than any of us. And I mean, it, that's I mean, it is about, about ideas, right? I mean, I, the term idea is now kind of with Ted almost like. Oh, you know, a dead word, but I mean, you're playing around with something, you have an idea, you have an insight on something, that, on, on what the world could be. And at some point, and, I mean, and if you kind of let your ego stand down, I mean, ideas are bigger than people. <coughs> ideas are bit, uh, bigger than individuals. And at some point, you just kind of realize that this thing is starting to take off and it's, it's, it, starts, it's, it wants to be something. And for me, it's always like looking at what is it it wants to be. I mean, Earlier today, I had a conversation with an entrepreneur who was like, I'm, I'm trying to kind of make this thing something that perhaps it doesn't want to be. And I mean, I'm just putting my toolbox on the idea and my perspective, my values. <coughs> perhaps that's not what this thing wants to be. Then, then, you can, then you can fight it out and try to push it to be something it doesn't want to be for a very long time. But that, that's also really frustrating. Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, how about the, uh, the actual dot com bust? Bust the. the, the with the years just around that, did you feel it personally on your own body? Do you have a good war story from back then? Oh, there are only war stories. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, once again, you're at a point in time that probably is never going to happen again. So, I mean, I, I don't think anyone today that wasn't, that, that wasn't there can even comprehend how crazy it was, right? Um, so, I mean, we're the punks with the internet, guys. In four years, this goes from being in Denmark, for example, 30,000 people online, eight, nine websites, to being 99, like, super mainstream, right? We were 20-year-old kids, literally 20 years old, in boardrooms, advising the largest companies on what they should be doing. 
uh, and being really frustrated about them not really reinventing their businesses, but only just like doing and uh, putting their their brochures online or whatever. <laughs> right. I mean, I remember like being doing some banking for like a very large bank. It's like, why aren't you reinventing like what a bank is? <laughs> you know, instead of doing this, it was it was a crazy time. And then then suddenly everyone was so skeptical. Everyone were against the internet. Everyone were against this weird thing that really did. Because the internet is so much bigger than any of us and any any company or any product or whatever, and and I mean it, it went from in three years from being something everyone were laughing off to being it, right? Uh, and then all the money started coming in and we were all chasing us like daddy patted ourselves on the back, you know. Suddenly the establishment wanted to be in on the thing also, and it just went totally berserk and crazy. And and I mean you know. Um, I mean, with, with me, with Reboot, I mean, we were, Reboot was like 400 people in 98 where we suddenly realized, wow, there's actually only, there are 400 people doing the internet. This is 98, summer 98. And we're, there was, there was the first time there was like 450 people in a room saying like, oh wow, there's actually really like, the people in the internet exist in Copenhagen. And then like two years later on, I mean, it was four and a half thousand people at night I remember sitting, kind of guiding, like this huge kind of show going on stage uh, with Mikael Battles, legendary Danish guy, uh, with like an intercom on, and then somebody, as a joke, was sitting there. Four thousand, four and a half thousand people. Um, twenty-two years old, twenty-three times. And then he he gives me kind of um, the fire department arrived. They want the whole thing shut down. <laughs> Is the message I get, and I'm like. And then 20 seconds later, 20, remember, that, that's probably the longest seconds in my, in my life, he said, ah, it was just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, it was crazy, right? I mean, so, I mean, I, I spent, I, I was sitting there, I've been patting this all, suddenly you were at dinners where, I mean, everyone were worth crazy amounts of money on paper. I mean, I, I remember like a, a dinner where I just realized, I looked around on the table and everyone, everyone were like on paper worth a billion kroner around me. It was like... What happened here, right? And, and it was just really crazy. And and then I mean, then it all ended. And I mean, it was like I spent, I sold my web agency uh, to another web agency that was called Framfab, crazy company. Um, and with the strategy that I was to roll out reboot events all over Europe. This is '99, um, and I would get unlimited funds to do set up my own team. And, and just like do 20 events all over the world, all over Europe and the world. And then, I mean, that's why I saw. So I was sitting there, summer 99, uh, they just sold this kind of 40 person web con consulting shop. Uh, their shares on the market was, was worth $300 million. They sold a 40 person web agency for $300 million uh, on paper. Uh, or, yeah, very. Very real paper. It was, you know, <laughs> it was on the stock, uh, stock exchange. Uh, every month that would come in, they were like, in the, for the last month of the, the day, all the kind of uh, all the cap, all the big five consulting companies, all their staff would be first day evening in line to uh, to sign their employment contracts. It was like a crazy scene. It was like after work, the the, the last day, of the, the day before the last day of the month. There was like 40, 50, 60 people lined up to sign their employment contracts so that they could go in and put in their resignation to their, their old established company the day after, right? And then obviously at some point the whole, everyone got stock options, obviously the management totally ripped all the employees off and the employees ended up paying off on their debts for many, many, many years and, and it was a crazy time. And then at some point it just kind of all ended started to run. It was so crazy. I mean, the theme of Reboot in 2000 was like karma. And this is like before the stock exchange going down. And I don't know why, I can't even recall why we picked that, but it was probably a symbol of how crazy it was that it was like, you should probably, it was like a yogi image on it. It was like, you should probably like get in contact with yourself. Here. Um, and then, then it just totally went bust, right? Uh, totally crazy from this kind of peak you're at, uh, and it's, but also a lot of energy, a lot of kind of cross-disciplinary things going on, um, a lot of fluff, obviously also. Um, and then some, then you just, at some point it was just like there's nothing left. I mean, symbolically, reboot in 2001, we had uh, Ev Williams on stage, 1,500 people. Uh, Dave Weiner, 
RSS blocking, kind of web APIs, a lot of other stuff you can find here. Ed Williams, uh, Blogger, Twitter, Medium. Um, and they were sharing all this stuff that was happening. We all started blocking, and people were just sitting there, 1,500 people like, but how do I get a job, <laughs> right? Because I mean, everyone were out of work, and, a lot, and most of them left the, and kind of left the scene, right? And, and got a job in some normal place. Uh, it was only the freaks that stayed behind. Um, so it was, it was the wildest thing. I, you know, I saw the beast of capitalism directly in its eyes. It wasn't pretty. Uh, people were backstabbing each other. Relationships didn't matter. People were just assholes. They were so, I mean, there were no values, there were no standards, there were no long-term thinking. It was just like, I mean, everyone realized, okay, this is crazy. And, you know, I'm just, I want more, I want more. I'm the best CEO in Denmark. I want more, I want more. It was a crazy time. So it goes from that down to nothing in the, like, 12, 6, 12, 18 months, depending on how you define it. Uh, so it was, it was really crazy. Um, and, I mean, I want experience anything like it ever the world probably won't it you know in in a revolution like the internet it, it happens once then it, it's going to happen over and over again a couple of times but on more limited levels i mean it's probably currently here end of year 2013 happening a little bit again right you can you can feel publish tendencies tendencies you also become really good at kind of feeling where you are in the, in the bubbles because when you've seen them um but it's never going to be as crazy as back then okay. so so, um, I mean, so, and I think we also, I mean, we went in naked, we went in with nothing, we came out with nothing. We just fucked the internet for three or four years and tried to <laughs> take things from it instead of really respecting what it is and building on it and doing something about it. Uh, and I think that was also the feeling that, that turned a lot of people were really, really value-based, really idealistic, really wanted to do things in a different way. Uh, after that, right? Um, probably also scared a lot of us a little away from actually doing companies and actually taking funding and external money and all that stuff because we were like, ah, we've seen this once before. Uh, so it took it, I mean, with, which also created this kind of little sacred ground for a lot of innovation to happen. Right. Uh, because that's why your, your, your blog bootstrapping done it started 2001 or, or what? Yeah, it was probably called something else back ah, then. Okay, okay, okay. I think it was called Common Me. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. All right, okay, okay. Until my mom okay. tried to ex say it and she said something <laughs> else. <laughs> then, then, I changed, okay. then, I, then I changed it. Okay, sounds good. Real story. So, <laughs> okay, it seems like you, you have been involved in a lot of different different projects and over the times, I mean, even the Twitter and the Instagram before they even existed. So, so which of the startup projects you've been involved in has been the most fun and why? I, I don't think it's about which one is, I mean, I think also you, you need to also need to realize you're part of a lot of stuff that you can't see, right? Every year I'm part of something that ends up not even being visible to the world, that it, that was something we were playing around with for three to six months. And then at some point we, we killed it because whatever for various reasons. It uh, could be just that some we were occupied with other stuff. Uh, could be an amazing idea, but we just had other things for more interesting to spend our time on. Um, so I mean, for me, I'm, I think I'm kind of later on really come to realize that I'm a kind of, I'm, a, I'm, a, a kind of a, I'm an addict for kind of the journey, right? I mean, the journeys are epic uh, and they're amazing and it, it's, I mean, it's, and it's such kind of human journeys, right? It's, you know, all the rest, it's just epic to, uh, to kind of be on this trip together with your friends, right? You're together with some amazing people, peak of their game, doing amazing stuff, doing something that's much greater than anyone could have done individually. Um, and it's just kind of crazy stories happening, right? I mean, um, and that can be early on. It can be the rush of creating a prototype that you then don't end up going, going forward with afterwards. Um, so I think, you, first of all, you need to realize there's a lot of stuff that, 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 you, that one have done that is not even on paper or, or visible. Uh, so there's a gazillion failures, right? Or things that just kind of got started and then you killed it off again because it didn't really feel like it was the right thing or you just didn't have the energy. Um, so I think everything is funny for, for different reasons, right? I mean, and some of it, I mean, I, 
I am a sucker for these kind of crazy stories, right? And I mean, um, what, what Rasmus and Ron with Upbeat, um, mm -hmm. what we've been doing there the last 18 months have been so crazy that it's, I mean, let's see, there's a lot of stuff to be done. But I mean, you're suddenly just on this crazy journey where, I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, it's like you have the co-founders of Facebook, Instagram, Spotify as angel investors, right? Um, and yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> crazy story. <laughs> uh, or like just call the Facebook co-founder and say, hey, got this cool company, you want to join? Or how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, something like that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, I mean, but I mean, so I, I think it, it is because it's, it's such kind of, you know, you, you have, you're working with a couple of guys that were just like everyone else. Uh, you know, just a, a, a really decent programmer and a really decent interaction designer. That's for some reason, the are just it. You know, you realize that at some point. Then crazy guys like me, I mean, I, I told them that a startup at this stage should spend half its time out meeting with, with, with the world, with the potential customers. So we designed this kind of CTO research journey where they would spend half their time uh, and they would literally they spend half their time traveling around the world. And I mean, I could start the journey a little by contact and relationship, but the journey ended, took on its own life, which was how it, it, end, it ended with, with some of these people. Um, and then later on, they realized, Thomas, you were just bullshitting us. We're the first one that's ever spent half our time <laughs> on, the, on the road. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, uh, but it's, it's, it really shows the value of being out there. Um, but I mean, you, suddenly things are just flowing and you're, you have amazing energy and, and it's just a crazy journey. I mean, it's just, it's just epic. And I don't know, I'm a sucker for that. Um, then you have other things that take a long time, right? Where you feel like, and did, because this is a very short period of time um, and hopefully <laughs> a very long story to continue. Um, then you have other things that you've spent 10 years of your life on, right? I mean, we're 23, we're still bootstrapped, uh, you know, we're on this kind of paradigm from textual to visual communication and organizations. Uh, we have a killer product to build video websites with. Uh, we've been doing it for 10 years, basically, in different iterations with the photo sharing service 2005, uh, competing with Flickr uh, back then. I mean, we live in a crazy world, even Flickr is like something, something the young kids don't, you know, like Instagram. Uh, Flickr was pretty big at some point, it was very skilled people <laughs> we were competing against uh, back then. Um, so I mean, th that, that's just a really beautiful journey of, you know, Stefan and I who started it, you know, we've been doing it for 10 years. And it's like any relationship, it's tough, <laughs> it's tough at times. But, but you know, it's, it's just a very kind of, kind of connected, kind of very cool thing to have been part of for so many years and also just something you want to be part of for, for the next many years. And, and I think that's also, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people con consider me like a thing, a guy that like runs from one thing to the other, but they just don't realize that I'm actually doing things like 10 years at a time, just kind of in parallel. Uh, so, I mean, it takes a long time and I think that's, that's definitely kind of one of my concerns for the age we're living in, where people are flip-flopping, uh, pivoting from one thing to the other. I mean, changing what you're doing is always a good thing if it's not working. But if you're not really passionate about it, you're not really going to stick out for eight, ten years or three or five years, no matter what. And no matter what, it's going to take six, eight years to build something. Even if you sell it after three years, you're going to sit it out for a few years afterwards. That's six years. Uh, I mean, it's it's very long periods of your time of your life you're spending on it. So it, it better be something that that is important and meaningful for you, the people you're with, the world at large, to be working on, right? Because you're not gonna stick it out for six, eight years if you're not really passionate about it and really stubborn and determined to prove some people wrong and to make it real. Okay. So, so the upbeat adventure is just starting, but how about Podio? Because this wouldn't be an interview with you if we didn't talk a little bit about Podio. How about the Podio adventure? How, how, did, that, how did that unfold? I mean, where did it all begin? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a crazy story and it's also, I mean, we're, it, it's, I mean, I, th I think what's really, for me, what the beautiful thing that people don't understand about kind of Podio adventure is that uh, it's really about a group of, a, group of guys um, really coming together to build something that bigger than themselves. It wouldn't, if any one of those five guys weren't there and the next 30 guys and girls that joined on the team, it wouldn't have been what it was. 
So, and I think because we have a tendency to, I mean, in Podio it's even, I mean, John, who is the kind of actual original co-founder, Anas, who joined on with him as a co-founder, <coughs> and, 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 um, and Casper, who joined later on, and Tommy, uh, who we got in to be the CEO and put in some money and skin in the game and whatever. I mean, it was just a really kind of big setup of a lot of people doing something really beautiful. Um, I don't know, personally for me it was like it was the first time in my life I had some excess cash because like all through the year kind of the zeros I've been kind of day to day on, on, on money and whatever. Uh, and John who was like an old friend and we've been doing a lot of experience with blocking and wikis and organization stuff like that. He, he asked me out for coffee and advice on how to uh, get an investor or whatever it was. And I was like, and then I, just, I don't know why I did it. I just said like, hey, I could put in the money. I, I, it was probably a really stupid decision. <laughs> um, then two or three months later after that, we totally changed the product. Today, I can't even recall why we were so crazy because it was super crazy. So we're sitting in a basement in Vestable, uh in Copenhagen, <coughs> uh, kind of a basement that's been used for some pretty dodgy stuff before. Um, um, and we're sitting there and we're, you know, okay, we're going to build a platform for work. That's our ambition. Okay, we're going to change, and our vision is to change how people work to make it more uh, empowered and more transparent. Okay, let's go make it happen. <laughs> and, and okay, and we're going to build the equivalent of the spreadsheet, hypercard, uh, access, file make, or whatever for the new era we're in. Something that lets people organize things in a very kind of lightweight, empowered way but where everyone can create it themselves. And you know, once again, weird stories back, right? I was doing FileMaker, which is like a data, how to build a database uh, stuff in 92, 93, right? Um, so I mean, a lot of it is just the same stuff repeating. So we're sitting there and then suddenly, and I think that is the new confidence that we live in today, that it wasn't, I mean, it seemed crazy, but it's just starting building and we started to get the confidence that it could start happening, we were super, we very quickly burned through the cash, so we were super kind of bootstrapped, needed to kind of sell something every month to make payroll, um, or, or at least get salary a couple of days later. Um, so there was this really kind of strong focus on being really, building a movement, being really in contact with customers from very early on. Um, and then it just kind of started stepping up, right? So, I mean, weird stuff started happening. We started to get the confidence. Um, we started, we were very vision driven on our product roadmap, which once again is not the kind of lean startup way to do it. We were making product decisions to show the vision and to prove to ourselves that that could be we're putting in calendars, tasks, all kinds of stuff, all way too early from a kind of lean startup perspective, but to show the vision of what this could become. And slowly we started having the confidence, right? And, and weird things started happening. We had a meeting in Germany with uh, kind of the European LinkedIn, um, where weird things started happening. You know, German, Germans are copycats, so we only showed the product for five minutes. Um, then they asked for an account. We said, like, come on, do you think we're stupid? <laughs> then, we, then we closed down the, the laptop. And, and then they said, like, um, okay, so in a podio world, what do you think our role is? And then we were like, what? We're showing you a half crappy prototype of a very visionary product, and you're just totally buying into the story and what we're showing you. You're gonna say like, you're accepting, okay, we're gonna be the world, and it's like, and then we're like, ah. You know, Podio is like when people are actually working together. You're like, the relationships people have when they need to find the next job or something. I, there is a role for you. <laughs> crazy stuff. So I mean, and, and you know, once again, you should, shouldn't. I mean, it, it sounds like a, cra a crazy story, which it also was. <laughs> but that was, I mean, Casper and I went down to the street. We gave, you know, the biggest man hug you can give, and we called up the rest of the guys who were back in Copenhagen, and we were just like, "Wow, this is like crazy." And and you know, that's just an experience. But that's what gives you the confidence that this is actually. You know, you're you're you know. I mean, you're creating something out of thin air, right? And you're, it's starting to become something. So these points in time are so fragile, right? The guys then, uh, I you know, I had an, an old friend who just sold the company to Google, uh, and as so I was like sitting in the meeting, like we don't want to sell, and they were like, ah, we could be a feature on their platform or whatever. Like we don't want to sell. 
And then on the way out, I like I walk with one of the guys that I knew uh, out to the reception. It was like a hundred meter walk or something, pretty big company. Uh, and we're like standing there, small town. The weather is like it's like why? Where's Casper? Then the, then the other guy. I was like, perhaps he needed to go to the bathroom or whatever. Then then it was like it went on for longer. So I was like, then he so he arrived like four or five minutes later, and and it's like then apparently the other guy. Uh, had dragged him into a meeting room and said like, you know, don't listen to that Thomas guy. We want to buy you. We can make you a really good offer and it can make you really whatever, something. <laughs> so, I mean, once again, so we were just down on the street afterwards, like crazy. Uh, we, we, when, we, when we sold, we, I sent an email to the, to the two guys from, from Sing and really thanked them and, and, made, and told them how significant what for them was just some biz dev meeting. How, how significant it actually was, and they actually also later on realized, they, they, they acknowledged that they also had understood that it was probably somewhat important. So, so you have a lot of stuff like that starting to happen. Suddenly it's like, okay, we could get Tommy, who just sold his, his previous company. He was just out of his uh, commitment. Uh, his wife wanted to go to the beach. Uh, he just had a little kid, literally when he joined Podio. Um, and we convinced him that we wanted to change how people work. And he should just like do another stint uh, instead of going to the beach. <laughs> um, that was a pretty hard sell. Also. Um, so that's you know once again this like you know do you want to be part of creating something or do you just that is going to be something very big and and I mean Tommy also you know serial entrepreneur or this was his second thing <laughs> so makes him serial. Um, um, you know, I mean, he could have done something himself and whatever, owned the whole thing and whatever funded the whole thing himself. So it was a tough thing for him to, you know, accept that he was only going to be a part of it, right? And then, whatever, raise some money later on, crazy circumstances, um, and then we just fired like crazy and didn't really miss a beat, right? And we, all the things that you, and I mean, that's also what you can do with money. You can do a VC funded startup, you can do some funny things, you can, you can execute on your ideas, right? And we had this idea of doing a pop-up store to make the product very real. So we, like, we'd build kind of an Apple story-ish thing, um, Soma uh, in San Francisco. Um, bought a lot of IKEA furniture, paid $5,000 for renting this gallery space per month for a couple of months. It wasn't really expensive uh, per se. Um, and then, I mean, then suddenly this thing starts being so real because we've been so much in contact with people We've been so humble because there wasn't a much to kind of be uh, and, and kind of jackass about. Um, and suddenly, I mean, we're, you're, and this is once again these things that are just epic, right? I mean, you're standing in SF, 400 people turned out to your, for your launch <coughs> in SF. It might be that we know some people in SF, but we don't know 400 people. Let's put it that way. There was like a line of 100 people waiting to get in outside. And you know we're sitting there. Uh, Tommy is gonna do this presentation. We're doing the whole kind of you know the big Steve Jobs keynote thing uh, down to the minute, right? Wrapping it up and whatever, and you know giving each other a big hug. Your whole team. We flew in the whole team. You're there. You're just playing your corporate anthem. The boys are back in town. Uh, you all. We also flew in our band. Uh, last minute, <laughs> last minute decision. I don't know. It was like there wasn't money, and I was like, "Why the fuck? Is there? Obviously, there can be money." And then whatever, I said, "Like, I'm gonna pay for it." If so, we let's just do it. Just fly in the two guys. They had a really. They they, they couldn't get their their drummer uh, to fly, so they went into the local uh, guitar store in SF, and there was like a guy. Yeah, I can play drums. <laughs> <laughs> they. They, they later on realized that he was kind of just an okay drummer, but these guys were like super uh, high-end studio, studio musicians. So they, they apparently later, they, I obviously didn't pick up it, but they, after the gig, they were like, after 20 seconds, we realized this guy is shit, so we're just going to overplay him. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so you're, that, you're in SF, you're, you have all these beautiful people around you that are part of creating this amazing thing. And, and, um, People in SFA use cocktail receptions, DJ playing and this is like a rock and roll band, like hard on. And I mean, you know, then, and then you play your co then you then you play your theme song, right? The boys are back in town, uh, which the band obviously, you know, it was the theme song, and and things just that's going. And I mean, then you're there, right? It's late night SF, and you're there with your whole team, 
a lot of hugging, a lot of you know, a lot of uh, compassion and, and and love in the air, and and um, and I mean, and and I think it's things like that that also comes across in in the product. It comes across in how you treat customers. Comes across in in your approach to the world in in this kind of very human journey. Um, and I mean, yeah, we were VC funded, whatever. But I mean, we were still very humble because it was such a big vision. It's still a very big vision, right? I mean, uh, I was, you know, you know, I was the working chairman. So I mean, when I gave my farewell speech when we sold the uh, the company, um, I, you know, I mean, my my hope for for the whole big team was a lot of people nowadays was like that they were gonna make the vision come through, right? Because we to some extent had only kind of got got the, the, the first X amount of people onto the vision, right? And there's there's still a long leg work to actually make it happen uh, on, on a great scale. Uh, so I mean <coughs> yeah, it's 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 stories like that where things starts, you know, taking you also you realize you can do things that you didn't realize you could do, right? And I mean and you realize that some things just ends up being a trademark of, of the company, right? I mean, the whole podio thing about having a rock band was not, you know, some cynical, yeah, we're going to have a band. It was just something that happened, right? We had an introduction event, uh, you know, which nowadays is what you do before you launch. You have an introduction, which, I mean, it might even be something we've introduced, the idea that you announce yourself to the world. And it was like a party on, uh, in Copenhagen with four or five hundred people. Crazy. One of the, the craziest corporate party I've ever been part of. Uh, it was totally insane. I mean, uh, and a hard-on party from 8 p.m. in the evening, and and a lot of energy in the room. And then you just end up okay. I think we just got ourselves. A, and you know, the rock band was just John's old friends from his music days. Okay, I think we now have a the podios. I think we have a band. I think we have a trademark style of how we market. And you know, and then you, then you work with that, right? I mean, but it's not, it's not always just big plans and whatever. I mean, a lot of the things we're fighting about to the last minute about how to do it and how to also have kind of a Steve Jobsy keynote about the vision while doing a party and you know, oh, you can't do that, and oh, then it ended up working. Right? So I mean, th there's a lot of these things we just really need to 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 when it is things start coming together, and and then you need to work with that energy and and kind of. Uh, and, and kind of, and then you conceptualize it a bit more, and and also, I mean, it was a pop-up store in SF we did, but it was because there was, we we wanted this to be a product that was really about empowering people to do things, and we knew the weakness of the product even to this day, is that it requires a somewhat heavy onboarding or kind of uh, entry barrier to the product, so that's why we wanted a store so people could go in from the street, and in 10-15 minutes get that wow experience of you know I can build something, I can create something. So I mean, it, it wasn't just, and later on people, it was, it became like a kind of a fast company, whatever, Forbes, whatever, kind of the best way to launch and whatever new ways to do things. But I mean, that was not the purpose of it, right? The purpose was really about uh, what we were doing with the company. Then it ends up taking its own life after. All right, cool. Thomas, I only got one more question. Then we we are we are we're seriously running out of time. So yeah. just one more question. Uh, you you already got I think one or two lifetime achievement awards, and you're about 35 years old. So, but obviously it doesn't seem like you're 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 slowing down because of those. So what's what's next for for Thomas Mason <laughs> Uh I don't know, and I don't think I'm, I'll ever know, and, uh, and that's probably. What it is to be Thomas <laughs> Um Yeah, I mean, I don't know all these kind of life, you know, whatever. I mean, I think I think my acceptance speech was like, people are not meant to get lifetime achievement awards at age twenty eight. Uh, <laughs> um, it could fuck with your head. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I'm I'm still I'm I'm really interested in what this internet wants to be. What is it it's going to do to us? How we really treat it with, with respect? There's a lot of friction in the world between big corporates and, and kind of society. There's a lot of friction between governments and society. Um, there's a lot of things that need to be reinvented. The, the list is endless. Uh, if you have the perspective of looking at what things are in a digitally networked world, then you can look at anything and you can start reinventing it and 
you know, I'll be doing that for the rest of my life. Uh, it's, a, you know, in various ways, uh, I'm trying to not do as much. I'm really trying to, to, to stay um, somewhat sane. Um, but that is, that is what I'll, I'll keep on doing. I'm currently, it's also a little like phases. I'm, I've been kind of very much in an execution phase. And I'm trying to get back into kind of a playing, thinking space. It's not really working, but I'm trying. Um, and I'm trying to get back to kind of facilitating people coming together. I'm, I'm really, I mean, we did a lot of early also like co-working spaces. We have this crazy uh, self-organized co-working space. Uh, also self-organized who bought toilet paper and eventually also who paid uh, the rent. Uh, that was how it ended. Uh, uh, but I mean, so I mean, there was a lot of kind of platforms, and I'm, I, I'm, I really love kind of building platforms for people to come together. And um, and I think I mean, there's a lot of people want want me to do reboot again, and oh, it changed my life and everything. But you know, I think at some, at some point I just realized that it, you know it, it 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 was probably changing people's lives, but it was also fucking my life. Uh, so the beast was like killing me. Um, but I'm I'm. I'm planning on getting back to doing things like that at some point when I have the, the time and energy. But I think it's also a little, you can only be in kind of, you can't be in a world where you're playing at the same, the same time when, where you're really executing because it's just, you know, it's kind of, it's either you're in one mode or the other. And I've come to realize it actually takes a considerable period of time to kind of get out of that, right? Because you have such a strong perspective to execute, to get things to work. But when you're playing, you're just playing, you know, you're not. <laughs> trying to force this too much, you're just playing around. Um, and the same with events. It, um, I really love doing events and bringing people together. And it is just like you guys today, it is just about announcing a date, a room, inviting some people, and then things start happening. Uh, it is really very little, uh, yeah. but then it's very much uh, mentally and energy-wise, etc. Um, so I, that, that's one of my that's one of my personal goals to, to try to, but I'm, I'm not really goal driven or anything or oh, yeah, okay. determined like that. So okay. we'll, we'll see what, what ends up happening. All right, sounds cool. I would be surprised if you gave me any other answers. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we have time for one or two audience questions. And just say that loud and then I will repeat it. Any questions? No questions. All right. Do you see ideas coming out of the developing world? Because um, it seems like the developed world is Everything is kind of invented, it's incremental in innovations. But certain countries around the world uh, are actually developing completely new stuff, but people don't really hear about them yet. Or some do, of course, but it's very limited still. Do you have any experience with that, working with countries? No. I, but I think you're very, you're very much right. I mean, our, our challenge in the developable world is to reinvent things. Mm which includes throwing things away. Right? We build up the stacks of our societies. We're really good at putting new things up on top of it. Just look at things like the Danish tax system and other great things that have developed over a great period of time. <laughs> but we're really bad at taking things out of it. And I think th I, eventually that will be our doom in, in, in the Western world uh, or in the modern, whatever, in the, in the old world as they call it in the US. Uh, even in the US, obviously also. Um, so, I mean, uh, I think you're very right. Uh, for me, um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think that it's, it's just an area, I'm blank on that, right? I'm blank on what's happening in, in South America, I'm blank on what's happening in Africa. At the same time, I think also, I mean, a lot of that is also happening on top of a lot of stuff that's not also good. I mean, the, the democracies and a lot of the systems and a lot of the things are not necessarily good. Um, so, I mean, it, I think it'll be kind of a race to, to reinvent, but I think, you know, um, I, I, I had a, um, uh, a great, uh, what's that, great, great grandfather's brother uh, who's, who's, uh, whose uh, kind of line of life was uh, let, let fall what can't stand, uh, which was some kind of ultra-liberalistic thing. Um, but I mean, for me, that, that is really, I think, the issue though, in the world we live in, that we don't let things fall, right? And I mean, there are a lot of things that are not currently working, but we're not letting things fall. I mean, um, just personally, I mean, we're working with Holly on changing banking. We're competing against five, ten thousand European banks that are all in some ways government funded. Uh, 
the startup is not government funded, which is a good thing. But I mean, it, it makes for some, some pretty bizarre perspectives on the world. And instead of creating new things and funding new things, we're trying to keep the old broken things. And that's just opportunities as entrepreneurs, but it's also really frustrating, right? And it takes a long period of time. So perhaps one should move to, to Africa or somewhere else. But I mean, that's not my story. That might be somebody else's story. And it probably it should also be the people of uh, South America and Africa's own story and not our story. That's interesting for me because I'm doing work. We're starting an incubator maybe in Armenia, which is, is becoming a large IT hub. And right now it seems like it's only the U.S. that has realized that and we have a lot of projects there. So we see how Denmark can have a little that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for one, one more if there is another question? Yeah. Okay. Um, you're a member of a uh, growth team under the uh, Danish government. Uh, what kind of advice are you giving me? And that's it. I think the, the first piece of advice to, to you is that, I mean, I, I love to do things under the radar, I love to do new things instead of sitting trying to change existing things. And <laughs> it, it's really tough. Um, also just the, yeah, the, the way you work. And it's like, Podio workspace, anyone? No, let's just send a lot of Word documents around to each other with 20 people on CC. Yeah. Um, I, it's, it's like a way I'm not really, I'm not totally, it's just on a kind of very banal, simple way. I don't even know how to work like that any longer, if I ever did. Um, so, so, I mean, so it, it's an activity I was invited to do this year. I've been doing it as kind of my activism thing for this year, to be a part of this kind of growth team where we're going to come up with some recommendations very shortly on, on how to get growth in Denmark through digital uh, tools, etc. It's been a really interesting journey. I mean, um, we were only kind of two entrepreneurs there. Uh, one of them left already because it wasn't working, or whatever the explanation was. Uh, she wanted to do her focus on her startup and her small kid, which was good. Um, so I mean, it's, it's just, I've, I think it's an interesting kind of battle around what the topics of the world are these days. Uh, it's also somewhat scary as an entrepreneur when you're sitting with the largest heads of banks and telcos and whatever, and they're all looking at like, we need more entrepreneurs, Thomas, you're the future. And I'm like, I'm, like, I'm an old guy. <laughs> like, I'm, are you really sure you want that? And, which I think is also kind of a symptom of the age we're living on, that there's so little direction, there's so little clarity on what it needs to be happen. And we should also really be wary of becoming kind of the cult of the entrepreneur because we're not gonna fix everything. Um, so we, we're gonna come out with these kind of recommendations. It, it's a really interesting journey. Uh, we're looking at a lot of very simple things. Uh, the Danish society spends three billion euro a year on IT purchases that creates very little, if any, lo uh, kind of startups, uh, either locally or, or in Europe or the, the world. Any, any bootstrappy entrepreneur will be like, okay, there's three billion euro. I think I can work with that somehow. We can do things that would make them be used in a better way. Uh, I think it's gonna be really tough to do in the real world. We're looking at a lot of education on, on how we get, really get um, kids to become creators and makers of the digital instead of just consumers. I mean, uh, actually one of them, we didn't get that story, but I mean, one of my defining moments that I later on realized was probably defining was age eight or nine, my math teacher, it wasn't totally not a part of the official curriculum, brought us into this kind of computing uh, room in school with these old kind of extremely old computers. This is mid, mid 80s. Um, and we coded basic, everyone in class, and we coded games and whatever, right? Um, I mean, I can't remember any of it but today, but I mean, it was really fundamental in, on how you see the machine. The machine is something I program. I'm not being programmed only by the machine. Um, so we're, so we're going to do a lot of recommendations on how do you do something on, on that topic in terms of the educational system. And once again, it's friction, right? I mean, my kids are building weird stuff in Minecraft, coming into class, and then they're being met by this whole different world. Uh, that ultimately probably <coughs> mean they're not really motivated by what's happening in there. Um, so I mean, so we're looking at a lot of kind of, and this is a long-term thing, right? And something we as a society, as a mature, rich society, really should be extremely, have an extreme sense of urgency on. Uh, 
it's not that it seems like we have also I, I mean that's also the pro problem of, of not letting things fall I mean we, we call it the financial crisis but it's a systemic crisis all over right because we need to reinvent things for a world the world we live in today the educational system doesn't make sense it was also designed to make good workers people that were abiding to the clock that did what they were told for 45 minutes and then they went out again they were not it was it's not a, you know it's literally i mean it was a rockefeller that and, and those guys that put the money into the, what we today call the school system uh, you know, starting in the u.s and then later copy it uh, over here um, and i mean there's so many fundamental things that are really substantial um, i think i'm still left with the idea whether i should spend my energy on doing government policies for education or whether i together with some people should do a new school um, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so that's probably the, the, the startup that, that got away. I was so really determined to do a school. Uh, I, I don't know why I had this idea. Actually, I had as a 21, 22 year old uh, that I that I that I mean that I should actually have have the confidence and, and the ambition to do a school for when my kids start in school. And I totally miss failed at that one. Um, but I mean, and, and I think that that is what it comes that comes down to. Um, are you going to let the thing run and, and fall and are you going to build the new things or are you working? And obviously I think it's a little of everything. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and work on that. But um, it's interesting times. Interesting times. Cool. Well, Thomas, thank you very much for, thank you. for talking with us today. You are a very hard guy to put in a box that I think I've seen written all over the internet. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it definitely has more than three dimensions, I think. So okay. thank you very much. Thank you very much.